Hello everyone and welcome back to the Pottery Corner, my studio down on the south coast of England near Chichester. Uh, today um, I'm introducing a new playlist of videos um, whereby we are going to embark on making a bird bath. Um, so those of you who watch the channel regularly will have seen the um, bird bath that came out of the kiln a little while ago um, and I've been commissioned to make another piece so I thought that I'd bring you along for the journey. So there'll be three videos in this um, series. The first will be the um, making of the actual bird bath itself and then I'm going to do a video on how to make the pinch pot birds which are going to decorate the inside of the bird bath and then the third one will be how I glaze it um, so I use different techniques for glazing um, that might be quite interesting to you so and then we'll see how it comes out of the kiln after it's glazed so you'll see it right from the beginning to the end so if you're watching this first one look out for the additional uh, videos which will come out as we progress through the project but I just thought I would quickly touch on a couple of things that I do before I start making um, a piece um, first of all I use my measure to measure my kiln capacity because obviously a bird bath is quite a large piece and I need to make sure that I know exactly how wide and how deep I can make it to fit in my kiln. So that's quite important. I have in the past made things that are too large to go in my kiln and then have to frantically find a friend with a bigger kiln. Um, note to self, always buy the biggest kiln you can possibly buy. Um, but obviously I'm limited to the load capacity that I have in my kiln. So I always measure the load capacity to make sure that I know how, how big I can make my items. Secondly, I choose which clay I'm going to use for the project depending on whether I'm using it as an inside piece, as a functional piece, or as a piece of sculpture or gardenware. Um, and in this instance, obviously, the bird bath is going to be outside in the elements all year round. Um, so I'm using craft crank clay. Now, quite a lot of you have asked me, where can you get hold of craft crank clay? Craft crank clay is um, quite highly grogged and something that you would use perhaps for sculpture, clay sculpture. Um, so I use this clay, it's very sandy, if you can see, there's a lot of sand, or actually it's, it's not sand, it's grog, which is um, mushed up, bisked clay to give the clay more substance. Um, so we're using craft plant clay. Um, I buy mine from my local clay supplier, um, but it does actually come, I believe, from Stoke-on-Trent. So. If you can't find craft crank where you are, um, maybe you're viewing from across the pond, then do get in touch with your clay supplier. Quite sure that they'll be able to um, let you know which of their clays is the nearest equivalent to craft crank. So um, I'm using craft crank for this project because obviously the bird bath is going to be outside all year. Okay, so um, I'm gonna get on with the make. And um, I do hope it's something that you might think about doing at home. Maybe if you're not making it in exactly the same way, it will at least give you an idea of how I've made it. And obviously when we come to doing the pinch pot decoration, um, that might be quite interesting if you're a, begin a beginner and uh, haven't sort of done any pinch pots before. So come along for the ride. This is part one. Look out for the others coming soon. So I've picked a variety of um, rhubarb leaves out of the garden. Um, obviously they are in varying sizes. Uh, this one is a much too big for my kiln. Uh, there is no way that I'm going to get um, a bird bath made out of this rhubarb leaf into my kiln. So I have picked uh, some slightly smaller ones this one again is still a little bit too large for my kiln. 
I have measured um, the leaf in both directions across the um, diameter of the leaf and even by making this into a bowl this leaf is still too big for my kiln um, so I have picked this one which whilst a little bit more moth-eaten um, in, in the fact that it has a few holes in it it won't matter when I actually use it and then um, the first thing that I do is prepare the leaf so I have already done it on this one but the veins on a rhubarb leaf are very prominent and whilst I want the veining on my slab what I don't want is for prominent veining such as this depth to actually cut through my slab so the first thing that I've done is taken a knife and literally popped my knife onto the vein cut into it like this and just taken off half if not more than half of the depth of the vein so you can see how much is coming off of here and I just spend a little bit of time taking that off of the very large veins like this one this one this one and I just take it off and off of the stalk so that I make the stalk at least half as deep as it is currently by cutting it about there so I hope you can see that so first thing I do as I say prepare my leaf ready for um, popping into my slab now I've prepared my slab so this is craft crank clay um, this comes from a company called pot clays in England um, that is the bag so it's craft crank and it's stoneware so it fires up to a top temperature of 1300 degrees while well, I only fire my stoneware to 1230 so it's perfectly fine for me to use outside all year round so that is the clay um, and I've rolled out a thick slab I really do not want this to be too thin at this stage um, so if I just cut a tiny bit off the slab you can see it's quite a thick slab and indeed if I measure it um, it is about 15 millimetres so a nice thick slab to start with because um, I shall be smoothing it um, and rolling it more when I get the leaf on um, so I don't want to start with a slab that's too thin so I'm going to take my ready prepared rhubarb leaf and obviously the bit that we're trying to transfer onto the clay is the veining on the back so you put the leaf up on your slab work out where it best fits um, in terms of the size of your slab just spend a little bit of time making sure that it's actually going to fit on the slab that you have and that is fine I might just move that just down a little bit so I get this bit on here I'm not worrying too much about the stalk um, because I will have a little bit of stalk but I'm not actually too worried about the stalk and then I'm just going to feed this rhubarb leaf onto the clay so that I'm happy that it's where I want it to be and it will overlap in places so then here I've got a little hole as you can see so I'll just make sure that the bit without the hole actually touches the clay and then I'm going to use a roller you could use a rolling pin if you don't have a, a mini roller like this one um, just to start um, pushing the leaf into the clay I don't want to do this too hard because again I don't want to make the slab too thin but I am making sure that I attach the leaf onto the clay I'm just going to spend a little bit of time ensuring that this leaf is down on this clay and again I'm just going to feed that bit there and hold that whilst I just roll that down okay once I've actually got the whole leaf down onto the slab like that then I will start to roll her in much more vigorously again I don't want to press too hard because I don't want to make the slab too um, thin but I do need to make sure that I have rollered all the edges 
because that veining is the bit that's going to show um, when this bird bath is actually made. So I'm just going to take a little bit of time. This is a fold here, so I'm not worrying about that bit. To make sure that that leaf is down on the clay and that the veining is transferred to the slab. As you can see, there's a little bit that hasn't got any clay under it here, but I'm not too worried about that. It won't really show at the end. So I'm just making sure that all of that leaf texture is down actually on the slab all the way through. Just fold that across. Take a little bit of time making sure it's right. There we are. Okay, so the leaf is now on the slab and all the veins are down into the clay so it's flat down onto the slab. Um, I'm just going to press the stalk in just a little bit so that I have an impression of it. Um, but again, I'm not going to press all of that stalk in because I don't want it to make the slab too thin. So at this point, I can uh, trim the slab from around the leaf. Um, I'm just going to leave a margin of two or three millimetres around the uh, actual leaf itself, um, which will be my sort of trim edge. And I am following the contour of the leaf because it's the leaf that gives this dish its beautiful shape. Um, so I do want to make sure that I've incorporated the shape um, into my finished piece. So again, I'm just going to come this side and just trim, as I say, two or three millimetres outside the actual leaf itself, following the contour of the leaf, taking away the excess. Coming down here and doing the same on that section there. Get rid of that. Now when it comes to the stalk, obviously it is the most vulnerable part of the leaf itself. And having made um, a few of these before, I do know that it's the bit that falls off. So. I'm just going to cut the stalk in, but I am going to make it very much wider than the actual piece on the rhubarb leaf itself, because I don't want to make it too vulnerable. So I'm actually going to leave myself quite a hefty stalk at this stage. I can always trim it afterwards. And again, I'm just following the lovely contour of this leaf to join round there and get rid of that bit carefully right okay so I've prepared my mold so our leaf is now ready I'm just going to shift it slightly oh, blimey it's very heavy um, so here I have my mold now this is a uh, dish that um, one of my students actually donated to the studio so thank you Fern um, and I've covered it in cling film because I don't want the leaf to stick to the mould. And then I've just used a plaster mould on top of a whirler just so that it's lifted up off of the surface because this is going to be bigger than the actual bowl itself so it will come down past here. So when you're making yours, allow yourself some room. Um, and then I'm going to pick the leaf up on the cloth like a piece of pastry. Now this bit is quite tricky um, and you might want to go and grab um, another human being to help you get it on there because it's not the easiest thing to do. So um, I'll try and do it elegantly but I have to say there's not usually a lot of elegance when you are transferring these leaves across. So I've picked it up on my arm on the cloth so cloth and all and then I want to put this leaf down onto the mould so it's going to be upside down so I'm just going to lift the whole lot move it over my mould 
and pop it down and then I'll move it across so that you can see. Right, so I now have the cloths, the slab and everything and the leaf on my mould. So I'm just going to take the cloths off first. And now I can see how much I need to move this piece across the bowl. So I can see that it's roughly, by feel, roughly in the middle of the bowl underneath. I'm not trying to force the edges down at the moment. I just want to see how much I'm going to have to um, prop this up with um, foam supports. So I use these, I think they're called waffle foam supports underneath against the mould so that I can manipulate the shape of the bowl on the top. So again, I'm just going to pop a couple of bits of foam under this section so that I'm working my shape of the leaf against this bowl mould because obviously it's draping um, and I want to make sure that it is supported um, whilst it's actually firming up so at the moment it's still too pliable for me to do anything with so I'm just lifting the leaf and placing the um, mould shape and the foam shapes underneath just to give it a little bit of flatness across the bowl. I don't want it to be too domed. As a bird bath, it needs to be not quite as deep as you would have it for a fountain. So I'm just going to use the um, foam just to give me a little bit of support underneath on my mould. And then I'm just going to, as I was saying earlier about this section here where the stalk is, it's obviously your most, your most vulnerable part. Um, so that's the bit that just needs to have a little bit more TLC. And indeed, I think what I'll do whilst I'm here is just add a little bit of clay onto this surface here where it's going to pull just to give it a little bit more thickness and I can sort that out during the making. I'm just worried that it might split. So at the moment, I'm just going to add a little bit of clay just to give me a little bit more to play with when I come to sorting out the base. OK, so I've got it on. As you can see, um, the underneath of the slab where it sat on the cloth, we've got a lovely crease on here and also um, I've used a couple of bits of slab, so I have a piece of slab joining there. So I'm going to use my rubber kidney. I like these Mud Tools um, rubber kidneys. Uh, they're very useful. They come in different colours. The yellow one is my favourite. I have a red one, but the red one is softer. But the yellow one is definitely my favourite. And I'm just going to gently rub the Mud Tool on just to take off, whilst this clay is so lovely and soft, the uh, crease marks from the cloth um, and also to compact the clay um, in its shape. So I did not compact the slab on both sides before I started this project. I literally just compacted one side that the leaf was going to go on. So the other side had not been compacted. And that is because I wanted to be able to put it onto the mold and then compact it into the shape that I ultimately want it to be. So I'm just using this um, yellow rib just to go over the surface of the clay, just to smooth out all those imperfections where the cloth was and also to compact the clay into its shape. I'm just taking a moment just to make sure that I'm happy with how that looks. And again, there's a crease on this bottom section here. So I'm just going to get rid of that. There we go. So this is the point of the leaf here. A few um, fingerprints in it there. That really doesn't matter at this stage. Um, but it is important to make sure that your slab is compacted because you need as much strength as you can get 
I need another prop underneath there. Let's just get that underneath there, if we can get it under. There. So I'm using the mould and the prop just to hold the clay. I'm getting a little bit of cracking going on here, as you can see, but I hadn't actually compacted that bit, so luckily it's gone. Okay, so at this stage, um, I'm just going to sort of check the shaping of it at the moment. I can change this as it dries, um, but it does fundamentally need to be the shape that you want it to be at this first stage um, in as much as I need it to have a nice pleasing bowl shape and of course you're always working upside down and that makes life a little bit difficult when you are working upside down. I'm just going to grab a bit more foam, a couple of bits. I use all sorts of things, it doesn't really matter what it is just gives you a little bit more volume underneath your clay to hold it out as it's drying. So I'm tucking this down. There's a little bit here that just needs a bit of TLC with the rib. There. Tucking the edges to make a nice shape. Okay. At this point, there is really very little that I can do with it other than just let it firm up, set up, whatever you want to call it. Um, and again, as I was saying earlier, you just need to watch this area because this is your, you know, your area where it is likely to split. So just uh, be gentle <clears throat> when you're forming around this area here um, because that is the area that is likely to go right okay I mean I could fiddle with it forever and indeed probably I do fiddle with things a little bit too much but I just like to make sure that the very first shape that I produce um, is the shape that I'm kind of aiming for when it's actually first on the form there we are. Right, okay. So this will now sit uh, unwrapped in my studio. It's quite warm in England at the moment. Um, it's probably about sort of 20 degrees um, centigrade. So it's reasonably warm in here. Even so, I will leave this unwrapped because I want it to, to set up um, so that I can, obviously, that I can work on it. I can't really do anything on it until it has dried sufficiently for me to be able to turn it up the other way. So this piece is now going to sit for, um, I would think half a day. I will check it again um, later tonight um, and we will see where we are with it. But I would imagine that it probably will be covered with plastic this evening. Um, and then I will see whether I feel it's firm enough for me to turn it over tomorrow. So. This is going to be a relatively long making project um, and you do need, if you're going to try it yourself, you do need to give it time to set up because otherwise it's just going to flop back um, and, and spoil your shape that you're trying to actually make. So there we are, that's your first stage. Okay, so we're back uh, the next morning. Um, I have just weighted down some plastic um, over the top of the leaf. I didn't actually wrap it totally in the plastic. Um, I've just used it just to cover over. So it was actually exposed all day yesterday and now is probably getting on for leather hard. I can still manipulate it, but it is hard. So what I'm going to do first is actually invert it um, I don't want to pick the piece up by the edges and twist it in any way. So I'm going to use a board um, and actually lift the board, the piece and the bowl that's underneath in one movement. So uh, wish me luck and we'll get this turned over. It's not the easiest thing to manhandle because it's quite big. 
but I don't want to oh, uh, up and over, pop that down there. We can get rid of that bit because we don't need that. And I'll pop it up, board and all, onto the whirler. So this is kind of what it looks like when it turns out. So you've got your bowl and all your foam supports that we used earlier. Um, so the bowl is now done with, we don't need that. It's done its job. And then I'm just going to take out the um, foam supports because again, they've done their job. They've shaped the bowl. Let's get rid of those. Okay, and what we're left with is our leaf. Um, it's, it's obviously still got the leaf in it um, because I wanted to make sure that it stayed inside whilst it got to its drying point. Um, I am being careful of this section where the stalk is. It, as you can see, it is still slightly pliable, so I'm just making sure that's not going to flop down too far and that it doesn't need a support underneath it. So first thing to do is to get rid of the leaf. And that is just a simple case of very gently lifting the leaf out. Um, they don't always come out in one piece. If they don't, it doesn't matter. Obviously that can be composted so that it's not put in the bin. And I'm just going to gently take as much of this out as I can. I'm not going to be too pedantic about getting absolutely every scrap off because obviously it will burn away in the kiln. Um, but I want to try and get as much of the green off as I can. So I'm just going to try and get as much of that off as we can. Um, as you can see, the veining uh, is beautiful on this leaf um, and it gives you that lovely texture. And the reason I don't take the leaf off until this stage is that if I had been manhandling the slab without the leaf on it, I would lose a lot of this texture. So I leave the leaf on it um, until I'm ready to turn the piece over and then peel the leaf off once my piece is nearly leather hard. So that's why I leave it on there. Sometimes you'll have seen videos where people put uh, leaves on um, and then they take the leaf off before they make whatever they're making with it. And actually, in this instance, I think it's better to leave the leaf um, so that the texture stays on the piece even when you invert it. So I've got most of that off. You can see there's a few stalks and bits and pieces which I will deal with um, off camera. Just to get rid of that bit. There's not very much, it only takes a minute really to get rid of it. And as I say, if you do have a few stubborn pieces, little pieces that are left on the clay, it doesn't really matter because they will burn off at the biscuit firing stage. So if you can't get them out, try not to dig them out um, because obviously you're then going to um, affect your shape of what you're making. So it's better really to just leave it now, um, here, as you can probably start to see, there is a little bit of a crack forming here. And as I said earlier, this is your vulnerable section of your make. So I'm just going to get a couple of little bits of the foam support and just prop that underneath, because obviously what's happening is that the slab is bending there um, and it probably just needs a little bit of support. So watch your stalk. That's your danger area. I am probably going to put my decoration on here, so I'm not going to worry about it too much right now. The first thing for me to do um, at this stage where the leaf is still mobile is to just play around with the shape. Um, and I need to make sure that it measures... Um, that it will go in my kiln. As I was saying at the top of the uh, introduction, quite often I'll make these and then go, ah, that doesn't actually fit in my kiln. 
Um, so my kiln shelf is 44 centimeters, which is there. Okay, so this is too wide at the moment to go in my kiln. The length's not too bad, it's just about there. Um, but it is, it is a bit too wide. So I do need to make this leaf come up a little bit so that it's not so wide. And this section here, where we have this sort of dip, is the bit that I am going to move. And again, I'm just going to prop there because that crack is forming. Right, okay. So obviously this is heavy. So what's happening as it's sitting on here is that it's starting to decide to unfurl itself. So I'm just giving it a bit of support just to stop this area from cracking. You can see, um, I hope you can see, that we're just starting to get a little bit of cracking here um, where the weight of the piece is um, making it um, too heavy to, to support itself. Okay, so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time just gently manipulating my rim because I want it to come up just a little bit don't really want to um, do too much about the shape. I quite like the fact that this is fluting because it looks more natural. It looks like a leaf. It looks like a leaf shape, but I do have to try and get this section here up a little bit so that um, I can fit it in the kiln. So we're just going to make sure that we've pulled those bits in to make sure that it will fit in the kiln. And again, you know, you can spend a little bit of time just making sure that you're happy with the shape. I am going to have to do some repair on this um, stalk section here. I had to do that on the last one as well. So clearly that is because obviously of the way that the leaf has been cut but I'm not too worried about it at the moment at this stage I'm going to leave it as it is I just want to try and manipulate this edge just a little bit more just to make it slightly rounder on that piece there and on that piece there um, as you can see this crack is is starting to go but I can repair it so I'm not going to worry about it too much so let's see where we are in terms of the width. Okay, so that has now come down to about 47. So again, it's still too large for my kiln. The width here is fine. Um, that will fit in the kiln. So um, I'm just going to use a paddle just to knock this shape in a little bit. So I'm using the paddle on the outside of the leaf and I use... This one is actually um, an olive tool that came from Corfu from a holiday, which I used to use in the kitchen. Um, so these sort of things, they don't need to be clay tools. You can buy or indeed find in your thrift shops or charity shops, spatulas like this. And the ones that have a curve on them, so like these, rather than this one, which is flat. I mean, obviously the flat one's brilliant for flat work. Um, but the curved ones are really good for things that have a curve. So I do tend to use this one being my favourite. And I'm just going to paddle in this... Um, I'm going to get another little bit of support just under there. Okay, right, that's better. I'm just going to just paddle it in just a little bit just so that I'm making sure before I let this get too hard that it is going to fit in the kiln. Because obviously, if I can't get it in my kiln, I can't get it fired. And it's amazing what a little bit of paddling will do. I'm just going to turn this top section here over just a little bit to make it a nicer shape. Not worrying about the edge at the moment. We will deal with that later. But once I have paddled the shape in a little bit, it 
good for your bingo wings, ladies, a bit of paddling. Right, okay. Um, I am going to have to watch this um, crack that is um, appearing here, which is a little bit uh, of a nuisance, but uh, I'll sort it out when, when I get to it. Try and prop it up so that it's uh, not going to make it worse. Give it a quick measure. Right, so okay, it's down to about 46. So there's a little bit more work for me to do. Um, and I'm going to sort out this area here, um, basically just by adding a piece of clay. I don't really want to add it to the front because obviously that's where my veining pattern is. And I don't really want to lose that. So what I will do is add it onto the back and use some slip and uh, just bring that in a bit so that we don't have this crack here. Um, I probably could have left this piece for another half a day out of the wrapping uh, just to make it slightly more leather hard. But then, of course, you have the, the added problem of uh, not being able to alter the edge to, um, to fit it in the kiln. So leaf is off. Um, we've done a bit of paddling. I need to sort out this little area around by the stalk here, which I'm going to do by adding a piece of clay to the back um, and just moulding that on. So that's where we are at the moment. So I've just done a little bit of mending on this stalk section uh, where the crack was appearing on the other side. Um, so I've added, uh, done some scoring, added some slip and just added some more clay onto this section and then paddled it in to give it a really nice strong reinforcement around the stalk. Um, and I've also just tapped the shape again um, whilst it's upside down just to make sure that I'm happy with the profile of the dish or the bird bath all the way around and I'm actually going to leave this because obviously adding the slip has added moisture so I'm going to leave this now I'm happy that the shape is just about where I want it to be and therefore I don't need to um, manipulate it anymore having turned the bowl up the other way so I'm actually going to let this now go to leather hard um, before I do that I'm actually going to put my maker's mark on the back um, because obviously when I'm turning it next time I don't want to keep turning it backwards and forwards so I'm just going to pop my maker's mark on which I will put on the stalk there two-part maker's mark with my pottery corner logo pop that one on there and that way it's all marked up before I need to turn it over again okay so I'm going to leave this now to get um, properly to leather hard as I say at the moment I am still able to very slightly uh, manipulate the, the sides so I would say another half a day um, and that will be leather hard and then we'll come back and we'll do the refining of the edges. So that's that stage completed. So Good welcome time. back everybody. We are working on the next stage of the 
um, bowl section of the bird bath um, and this is now firmly leather hard um, it has taken several days to get to this point so um, don't be too impatient with your work let it dry to where it needs to be um, before you move on to the next stage so as you can see um, there are still a few little bits of green on the um, on the leaf from uh, where we took the rub the actual rhubarb leaf off. I have to say, if there are a few bits on it, a they tend to go a little bit mouldy, and b they tend to be a little bit smelly. So if you can get it off, um, get it off, but don't worry too much about it. I'm just going to move the studio light in a little bit so that you can see. Right, so what we need to do now is think about this edge, which at the moment has just been left cut um, with the knife from when we cut around the leaf. And obviously that's not a very nice um, finish for my commission piece. Um, and I certainly don't want to leave um, it looking like that. So um, the next thing that I'm going to do is actually do the edge. I'm still picking bits of green out, but uh, it doesn't really matter if they're still there. It will burn off in the kiln. Um, so I have several tools that I use. Uh, this is um, a, a standard shore form. Some people call them sur forms. Some people call them shore forms. Um, this one has a handle on it and you can use it like, like a grater, but it'll only grate in one direction. So you can't use it like a piece of cheese. Um, it only grates in one direction and I always put the button away and pull the grater towards me. This is the same thing but in flat form and this is a mud tools um, shore form. Actually I don't think they call it a shore form, I think they call it a grater. Um, and actually it's a lot easier to use. Um, sometimes if I want to do something round and flat I will use this one but I have to admit that I've gone over more to this um, this mud tools one and then I have my trusty old um, garlic grater which has a little um, receptacle on the back um, and again that only grates one way but it's very much finer the texture of the grate is very very much finer um, and then any of you who have watched my videos before will have seen me use these which are basically dishwasher scrubbies they are my favourite thing for edges. They are an absolute lifesaver. And the worse they get, the more lacy curtains they get, uh, the better. So a nice, a nice group of um, scrubbies is, is always available in my studio. Brilliant for edges. So what I'm going to do is just kind of work out what I actually want to get rid of. There's not a lot. And then I'm just going to use the flat... Um, mud tools grater whatever you want to call it I want to take some of this slab width away at the top um, as it's going to go into a garden I don't want to make it very thin and susceptible to breaking it does have to be fairly robust so I'm just running this um, grater across the surface just to take off the flatness of the cut because it's quite flat in places i'm just working from the back of the piece to the to over the sort of over the surface of that edge and already that's made a huge difference i'm just going to get myself a, a brush I use these um, hakey brushes uh, to brush the bits off because I find if you try and get it off with your hand nine times out of ten you stick it back onto the piece so I'll do more of that in a minute but I just want to have a look and see um, where we've got to before I go very much further okay so it is better than it was there's still a little bit here that's not particularly pretty um, so I'm going to just take this grater, just do that little bit there. This time I'm going to just run it slightly over the front edge 
just take off you can see there's like this little bit here I just want to get rid of that that's not very not very pleasant to look at just manipulating the actual edge shape gently as I go being careful on the stalk as I was saying before about the stalk it's your uh, it's your danger zone so I'm just going to very carefully go around the stalk and then just take off the squareness if you see this is quite square here I just want to make that into a more rounded surface just taking off the squareness right okay so I've been round get my brush have a look and see where I think it's at um, you can see that I've repaired the crack area there's a tiny little bit there um, but I'm not worried about that because the pinch pot um, flat um, birds the pinch pot birds will be going on to there so I'm not too worried about that right okay oh, there's one of my hairs in it which is rather delightful don't you always find that as a potter that we get our hair in everything good job it burns out in the kiln okay so I'm quite happy that that's a better looking edge than it was a moment ago um, just from that little bit of time um, doing that I'm just going to get the bits out of the veining now. I'm just going to brush them out. I will give it a very good brush when I've completely finished doing everything so I'm just getting the worst of it out for now. Pop it back on the whirler. Right so I'm going to take my scrubby um, and I'm going to literally scrub the edge. So on in this instance I'm going from the back I'll just do this section here you can see that it takes some of the clay off on the scrubby and then I'm going to come across onto the front with the scrubby and it magically makes you a beautiful edge I mean it really is just one of the best tools that I use in the studio where you can take something that uh, looks rough and ready and just spend a minute or so just going over it with a piece of nylon um, and it makes a huge difference. There is actually a video on the uh, channel which goes into um, edges a little bit more if you wanted to take a look at that. If I show you the difference close up, so this is the unscrubbed edge here that we haven't done yet and that is the scrubbed edge that I have just done. So it literally, it, it smooths it completely and leaves you with a lovely edge. So it really doesn't take any time at all to do five minutes worth of scrubbing on your piece. Um, and I'm just going to quickly go around and do the remainder of this. So I've been round the whole piece. Um, I was careful around the section by the stalk um, because I'd need to make sure that I'm protecting that. So holding it from the back as I'm scrubbing, etc., so that I'm not going to knock it off. Um, and I'm just going to brush the edge so I can actually see what I've got. There appears to be a little bit of something stuck on there, if you can see it. So I'm just going to flick that off I don't want that on there and again there's a little bit there 
there's still a little bit of green on here other than that I'm quite happy with um, with that edge now it looks pretty good to me um, because we're going to attach the birds into the actual bird bath itself I need to keep this um, leaf covered because obviously I need to have this still leather hard to be able to attach the birds to so this is now going to be rewrapped um, it's finished apart from adding the birds um, so I'm going to rewrap it in plastic and then the next part of this playlist on how to make a bird bath um, will be part two which um, will come out hopefully in a week or so so that's your lot for today um, thank you for joining me on this project of how to make a bird bath and as I say, there will be three videos in total, this being the first of them. So if you're on the first one, um, thanks for joining me um, in the making of this bird bath. And I'll see you all on the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.